Greetings from Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very much hope that this video finds you well and in very, very good spirits wherever you are in the world. I certainly am very happy indeed because with the great uh, cooperation and working together with the Embassy of Mexico, I was afforded an opportunity earlier today to speak one-on-one -on -one through Zoom uh, with the filmmaker Carlos Cuaron. And what you're about to see is the one-on-one -on -one interview that I had with Mr. Cuaron. He was so generous with his time and he was very insightful and courteous and so polite and funny and witty and so intelligent. It was such a pleasure for me to be able to speak with him. And so I hope that you enjoy the following interview conversation that I had with Carlos Cuaron. I would like, of course, to extend my deepest thanks and gratitude to a number of people. Uh, and I'd like to thank, first of all, Rodrigo Mendoza uh, for helping to arrange this interview to begin with. I don't think this could have been done without Rodrigo's great assistance and uh, uh, aid it, and support. Uh, so thank you very much to Rodrigo Mendoza for, uh, for the great support that you provided. Also, I must thank Miguel Batel at the Embassy of Mexico here in Tokyo. Uh, thank you so much, my friend, for reaching out to me and for, uh, for your great discussions about cinema and also for helping to arrange this one-on-one -on -one conversation and interview that I was able to have with Mr. Carlos Cuaron. I would also like to thank the great people at the Embassy of Mexico in Tokyo for your kindness and generosity in uh, making me feel welcome and for allowing me to to uh, borrow uh, your facilities in order to be able to speak with Mr. Cuaron directly. It was, uh, I, was, I was very moved and touched, and so thank you very much to uh, the Embassy of Mexico in Tokyo. And I would also like to thank Mr. Carlos Cuaron for making himself available to me and for once again being so kind and generous with his responses to my questions. I really really appreciate it. Uh, and so you can find all the information down below if you're interested about uh, Carlos Cuaron. I will also try to provide information about the, uh, the Embassy of Mexico here in Tokyo for anyone who is interested about events and uh, where to find more information about that. Uh, all the information and links will be in the description box below. So please enjoy that uh, and I hope you do. And with that, I would like to now say here is the interview conversation that I had with Mr. Carlos Cuaron. Greetings from Tokyo. Uh, this is Daisuke, and I am so honored today. I am speaking to you from the Embassy uh, of Mexico here in Tokyo, Japan. And I am so honored because joining us today via Zoom uh, internet meeting is the one, the only, Mr. Carlos Cuaron, who has been so gracious in sh uh, sharing with us a little bit of his time despite his very busy schedule. And so without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Carlos Cu Cuaron. So thank you very much. It's a real pleasure and honor. Thank you. No, thank you, Daisuke. The honor is mine, the pleasure is mine. Uh, that's so kind of you to say. Um, and I am speaking here from the embassy in Tokyo, uh, the Mexican embassy in Tokyo. And so uh, hopefully uh, dur during this conversation, we, I would very much love to hear your take about, for example, uh, the cinema of Mexico and also the cinema of Japan and also if, uh, the literature as well, because of course uh, you have a very deep knowledge and appreciation of writing and literature. And so hopefully these questions and discussion points can come up along the way. I'm looking forward very much to hearing your insights. 
uh, on this and many topics. Uh, but before we move on, I'd like to ask you, if you don't mind, uh, at the moment, my understanding is that you are currently engaged in a, a project, a film project, uh, or maybe it is uh, close to completion or completion. Uh, it's, uh, I understand the title is, uh, please uh, forgive me for my poor pronunciation during, throughout today, but uh, Amal Gama, and so uh, if, if uh, it's okay, uh, could I ask you just a little bit about this project and how it's progressing or if it's uh, at what, what, what the state of such project is? Well, uh, yes, uh, the, the film is called uh, Amalgama, uh, which means, well, amalgam. <laughs> no, the, the word comes from Latin. And um, it's almost finished. We are in the last stages of uh, post-production um, without pushing it, you know, because uh, I, we don't think that we're going to have... Uh, a release this year because of the because of COVID, you know. So it's it's not easy, um, and we have some commitments to 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 do this mix in uh, in in the Dominican Republic because the the film is a, a Mexican Dominican uh, co-production, uh, and so we will do the final sound mix probably in November. But meanwhile, I mean, it's finished and what we're doing is uh, selling it, you know, showing it to the distributors and to the sales agencies and, and receiving their feedback. And we are exact at that stage. Oh, well, I wish you all the best uh, in uh, reaching a, uh, the completion and also distribution, especially during these times as you referred to, it's a kind of a suddenly very difficult time. So uh, I, you know, I, I really wish you, of course, I wish you uh, the, the uh, best with that. And I look forward to, and I know I speak for many when, we, when I say that, you know, we really look forward to your latest work uh, in uh, your uh, already very fascinating filmography. So uh, we look forward to this very much, sir. Thank you. And speaking of your filmography and your work thus far, uh, if I may, I'd like to first ask you uh, or just uh, talk with you a little bit about your uh, work as, uh, in, your own, uh, in your own way as a, an artist. And of course, you have made such a, a great impression, such an uh, incredibly profound impression uh, on the, uh, the, the, uh, the scene of the cinema of Mexico and also on the world cinema stage, uh, which is, and it's even more fascinating to realize that of course you are an artist of many hats, so to speak. In other words, you are a director and you are also a writer. And uh, so, uh, Asking first about the writing process, I understand that you have a very deep knowledge and background in literature and also uh, you know, many kinds of literature. I, I read also you, are, you studied of, like English literature uh, and, uh, and the like. And so uh, may I ask uh, just uh, what is your, uh, how should I put it? Oh, and also, I'm sorry, before I ask the question, I want to say also that I recall uh, with great fondness in an interview that you gave in a, a DVD uh, for the Criterion Collection for the film uh, Solo con tu pareja, uh, where you described uh, cinema and literature. And uh, the quote is, you described it about how uh, you, uh, you were holding hands with a sweetheart, your sweetheart named literature. And you were like, you said, we were like nervous, sweaty palmed lovers. And then one day you were introduced to cinema. Uh, and of course, uh, things uh, progressed uh, from there. And so may I ask, what is your relationship with literature? How did your relationship with literature uh, grow and blossom 
And where is that uh, relationship with literature right now in your life, both uh, you know, in terms of your uh, uh, appreciation of literature and art, and also your work as an artist? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's always been there, mm. you know? Uh, and yeah, I, I probably not sweaty hands anymore, or <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I still uh, write um, what is called literature. And, and when I write my scripts, I also consider them to be literature. Uh, so, you know, I mean, it's kind of the same. But as formal literature uh, goes, um, yeah, I, I hope to publish uh, soon uh, um, uh, uh, say a, uh, a book of short, of short stories. And uh, I, I'm still a, a novelist in the closet because I mean, I have the novel in my head and in, in my notes. <laughs> Uh, in my notebooks, uh, and I will write it, uh, I don't know when, I hope soon. Um, and then, well, I, I read, I, I, I am not the good reader I used to be when I was young, but I still read and try to, to keep in pace with what gets published, you know, and uh, and to see what's being uh, written here in Mexico and elsewhere, you know, and then that's how you kind of get your own uh, cliches or your own uh, favorites, so to speak, you know, I mean, and uh, yeah, so yeah, I, I, I cannot say that I read a lot because I used to read a lot. <laughs> But I, I, I guess I read enough in, in the sense that uh, it's, it's what I can, uh, because I'm, I'm, I work, you know, and I have other stuff to do. And, and before, because I did English literature, well, I would read a lot, obviously, you know. And this is so interesting because, of, as you mentioned, you, are, uh, you have written, of course, uh, your works, uh, and uh, the films that you have directed as well, you have also written. And I, I must ask you also what's, what was fascinating too about your earlier director, directorial career. Uh, I read about your film um, Noche de Bodas or Wedding Night. Mm -hmm. And I read about how you were inspired to, for that idea and about the, in the hotel and taking a shower and uh, maybe uh, one of the cl uh, uh, cleaning people came in accidentally and that inspired this story which you took very brilliantly into a very, uh, I think, uh, funny and uh, uh, very relatable setting in terms of young lovers and uh, the excitement of young love and sort of that uh, maybe hiding and, and that sort of uh, nature that I think we can all understand. And so uh, may I ask as part of the creative process that you are engaged in, so where, you know, you, you describe wedding night as coming from this idea, this experience from your own uh, personal life uh, or experience, where do you see uh, your ideas coming from generally, or how do you see yourself being inspired uh, in the way that you end up making the films that you end up making? Where do these ideas uh, that you end up making films about in art, where do you think they come from uh, for you? Do they come from everyday experience or do they come from somewhere else? Well, they come from everywhere. You, you know, and, and the idea is just to uh, keep oneself open to that because you don't know where the ideas are going to be coming from, you know. Sometimes they come from behind and you have to be like very prepared to catch them and, and, and be aware of them and then uh, develop them. Uh, that is one example. In that short, it's true that it was uh, 
inspired on, on, on that anecdote that I had. Uh, uh, and, and then I did something different, you know, uh, because that's how, uh, that's how it goes, how uh, uh, creativity goes. Uh, you don't do this, the things like as they happened, because they usually don't work that way in, in filmmaking. And, uh, but several other ideas I get from different places. For example, uh, an, another short film that I, that I shot uh, that same year, that is called uh, You Owe Me One, Me La Debes. Um, that was in inspired by a short story by Chekhov. Uh, I think the short story is called The Fireman. Um, I don't remember. Uh, but it was a, a very simple Chekhovian anecdote. Uh, you know about, uh, about the the maid's lover, no, and um, and I did something very different because I was just inspired by Chekhov. I didn't want to do his his short story. I would have done his short story if I wanted to, you know, adapt it. Uh, and uh, uh, and then each uh, story comes from a from a totally different place, you know. I mean, it mamada mien. We've said it many times. It, it, it really started with uh, with El Chivo, you know, uh, saying, "Hey guys, why don't we do a, a a movie about some guys going to the beach?" You know, and, and, and we were young and it sounded cool. And we were like, yeah, let's do it. You know? And then, you know, my brother and I took it by heart and we did it. Uh, uh, Cursi comes from, wow. Uh, originally, uh, I, I wanted to make a, um, uh, how how do you call them? Um, a, a mockumentary, so to speak, a false uh, documentary, uh, and then I ended up doing what I did. You know, so uh, ideas come from an image. Sometimes it's a dialogue. Sometimes it's the music. You don't know. I mean, you never know. I I just keep myself open, and and, and that's how I, I how I operate. That is, of course, uh, very fascinating because that means, of course, as an artist and as a creator and as a creative force, you said you know, from in front of you, behind you, around you, uh, from the experiences of the now and experiences of the past and your family life and growing up and with your friends. Uh, this is this means that uh, I'm, I'm not a creative man, but I can imagine that maybe this means that you are almost constantly uh, feeling the stimuli from the world around you and the, and the environment. Uh, yeah, well, I of course, I, I, like anyone else, you know. I mean, I'm just probably a, a more aware, probably I don't know, uh, and that's. Uh, when when I leave my my office, you know, because <laughs> I mean, even without the lockdown, uh, I, I'm not a guy that goes out that much. No, <laughs> so, but yeah. <laughs> and one of the fascinating things about your career, there are many fascinating things about it, of course, but uh, you you speak about influences and you speak about uh, the idea, the creative process. And one of the things I've noticed in your career is maybe, especially uh, maybe lately uh, with works like, uh, again, please pardon me for my poor pronunciation, but El Sandwich de Mariana and also Besos de uh, Azucar, or in English, I think it's called Sugar Kisses, uh, in, which is uh, later, in your more recently in your career, obviously, uh, you, you seem to be focusing on maybe like a child's perspective 
and uh, the, this kind of uh, uh, POV or point of view style, uh, which is, I think, very important. And uh, this is a very interesting, maybe, comparison and contrast with the work that we saw from you uh, maybe earlier in your career uh, as a screenwriter, of course, with the solo con tu pareja, we had uh, maybe a, an older, maybe a, maybe up and coming middle class, but still adults. Uh, and also you're writing uh, the, the work in Itumama Tambien. They were, these were still young people, but uh, they were in the youthful and discovery, um, uh, but they were slight maybe uh, growing into adulthood or maybe just prior to that point. Uh, Rudo E. Kursi, I think, is a similar type of, de of, of growth uh, and development style. Um, and uh, also, we, we find uh, characters in uh, your short, like uh, The Second Bakery Attack, uh, which is also very interesting work. I want to ask you about that one later. But uh, it, this is an interesting uh, shift that I notice. And so is, is this... Uh, how should I put it? Is this like kind of conscious on your part in terms of the type of art that you are finding yourself uh, more uh, focusing on in this point or in, in during these past few years in your, uh, in your art? Or is this kind of a maybe a natural process uh, based on the, the type of, of concerns that you have as an artist? Well, yes. And at the same time, you know, things just happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I always wanted to to tell uh, a coming of age story, uh, you know, in in terms of, uh, of like twelve year olds uh, with sugar kisses with with uh, besos de azúcar and and with uh, a sandwich that Mariana was uh, like trying to go somewhere else obviously because i don't want to repeat myself but uh, uh, those two uh films come from two very different places you know i mean uh, besos de azúcar comes from from one side uh <clears throat> when i was uh when i was six uh, I fell in love for the first time, and I fell in love with uh, w with a woman I couldn't even touch, uh, and that was huge, enormous, because the screens back then were huge, and and it was this girl uh, called uh, Melody, and it is a a film by Waris Hussein that was also very popular in Japan, by the way, and uh, um, and so I always wanted to make my own. Now, uh, first love story, uh, but I didn't want it to make it like like uh, like you know like tender and kind of corny and sweet, because that's not my thing. And at the same time, one of my favorite films when I was young was The Four Hundred Blows because it's an amazing film, basically. And uh, and so I, I I thought that it was a great idea. Uh, to do like melody meets the 400 blows in terms of the tone uh, with my own thing obviously uh, and set it up in in, in a Mexico that uh, that is very archetypical because of the neighborhood of Tepito and uh, and my co-writer Luis Susabiaga a long time ago uh, uh, told me a story that he had in Tepito, you know, and so I asked him, I mean, remind me the story in Tepito because I don't remember, and uh, and there was no story. What there was, it was a, a great um, world atmosphere, the family, the dysfunctionality, you know, and and so I said that okay. I like that. I like that, but I would like to make a, a first love story with that in this very tough context and with this tone that should never be sweet. It could be bittersweet, but never sweet. You know, it, it, that's why also I chose a, a Beethoven to musicalize it because Beethoven is that. Beethoven is very German, you know, I mean, he's very mus muscular, you know, very strong, very. Uh, 
uh, all of that, but he's never corny. He's never like really sweet. Uh, um, uh, and then El Sandwich de Mariana, I, I actually got invited to uh, to make a short about uh, violence in Mexico. And uh, I, I was invited together with uh, people like uh, Amat Escalante, uh, who, who did an amazing film, a uh, short film, by the way. Uh, and uh, Alvaro Curiel, and who, who else? We were like five, I remember. And so it was this organization that wanted to make a short, a short film, you know, about domestic violence, about uh, I don't know, uh, sex violence, whatever kind of violence there is. And, and as a part of violence, uh, bullying is part of that. Uh, so I chose that theme and, and I, I, I didn't have uh, the idea. <laughs> you know, I just chose the, the theme. Uh, but I remembered that uh, Jonas, my nephew, uh, his mother, had told me uh, that, that she was bullied when she was a, a little girl, you know, in a very fancy school. And, and she told me the story again that was very, very simple, actually, you know, and I said, okay, that's cool, but what else? And because creativity uh, generates creativity, uh, then I, you know, I, I saw the girl following the other girl and, and, and looking into the bully's life and, and see how uh, violence in, in humankind is generated by a, a chain, a, a chain that reacts uh, and generates uh, a chain reaction at the same time. And, uh, and I wanted it to be a, a short about forgiveness and, and, and therefore about consciousness. I mean, this little girl at the end, she understands that she actually does not suffer that this other girl is the one who suffers the bully you know and that a, an act of generosity of compassion uh, breaks that chain uh, that uh, that violence uh, chain uh, and that pattern of behavior uh, and obviously this sounds uh, idealistic uh, and it probably is but it's also true I mean, there are many examples in, in life and in history that is better to choose this way than to choose the way of violence and, and confrontation, you know, many times. You know, and, and I mean, you come from, from, from Japan, so you know what I would say when, when I say no action, you know. No, that is, that is, well, that is well said and um, it, there's a, something, a kind of an, an immediacy, and there's a sort of kind of power that uh, you describe about this kind of discovery about uh, other people and the people around us when we are very young. And this, uh, the, what's the word? Uh, epiphany kind of mm -hmm. moment, which is very important. It's, it's a very a literary thing, of course, but it's, a, of course, very cinematic and very powerful. And I think we all can relate to this. Uh, kind of this idea of discovery, uh, whatever form it takes. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I find it very fascinating. Oh, incidentally, in your wonderful description here, you mentioned about how this was uh, uh, El Sandwich de Mariana. This was uh, in part uh, maybe uh, inspired by uh, a story that you heard uh, through your family, uh, and so I'm, I'm also. Uh, curious, how much do your uh, do your relations with your family uh, inform the work that you end up uh, creating? Uh, the reason why I ask also is because I'm reminded of a really lovely story that you uh, told in an interview that you gave regarding Itu Mama Tambien and about the word uh, ch uh, uh, charolasta. Mm -hmm. and uh, how this was derived from uh, the, the word that you asked, I believe it was your niece, about, and you used the word that was from the, sh the movie Shrek, 
and how this became part of uh, the language of the landscape of the film. And so I, I'm, and that is a really lovely story. And so uh, as a follow-up to that, I'd like to ask you to what, uh, in what ways does your family and your f uh, family relationships inform the work that you are creating uh, in terms of your writing and in terms of your filmmaking? Well, the thing is that if, 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 if you're open, uh, you know, uh, then it doesn't matter where it comes from. And the thing is that the most immediate context, obviously, is my family. I mean, I, I don't live alone. I have a wife, I have kids, and then I have brothers and nieces and nephews and everything and I, I and and we have a loving relationship so i just keep myself open and, and what happened that time with with the title last word was exactly that you know i was i was looking for a word and something happened like an epiphany uh, because that's what happens in when you're working with creativity uh, uh, you are like attracting the, the right energy uh, for the project in a way. Maybe sometimes it's the wrong energy, but you find out sooner or later. In this case, was the, the, a good, the good energy because uh, it, was, it was funny. I mean, it was funny to, to hear how my niece referred to her own friends and then <laughs> When I asked her why they had that name, which was not Charolastras, you know, something different, uh, the explanation was that of the Shrek song at the, in the roller, you know, the credits roller, that this guy didn't speak English and he sang it instead of saying, you're an all-star, hey, hey, babe, you're an all-star, exactly. In, in Mexican, he would say uh, Charolastra, instead of you're an all-star and uh, yeah and, and and I took the word tweaked it and gave it a different et etymology inside the script obviously uh, and and yeah that's how it works it's, it, that's how it works sometimes it's literal sometimes it's not literal but you know I, I take things from everywhere and, and people ask, how autobiographical is your work, your films? Well, they're autobiographical because there's a lot of me in them in different ways. So some of them are biographical, some of them are not. But in terms of energy, well, man, I live my life. And if I write, I express something about my own life, even if I don't mean to. Yeah, that is uh, well said, uh, and uh, the, uh, the the comment of a true artist, I think. So uh, that is uh, really quite lovely. And uh, you, of course, refer to the uh, working process and how what inspires you and your everyday life and who you are, of course. Um, and this leads me also to just asking about your your working process as uh, let's take as a, as a writer and a screenwriter for the projects that you've worked on. So I, I understand, of course, that you've had uh, for your different projects, for example, some projects you have worked uh, in terms of writing, you've had a, uh, you've worked with uh, another collaborator, of course. Uh, so for example, you mentioned uh, Luis uh, Usabiaga uh, and, uh, and also there's Alfonso Cuaron. Uh, and uh, so these are uh, two collaborators of yours in the writing process for the for the respective projects, of course. And I and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe uh, Luis Usabiaga is also uh, you worked with him for your current project. Yes. Uh, yes. So this is uh, and so this is I think a kind of an interesting continuation of uh, the this uh, working uh, professional relationship that we all are looking forward to watching. Uh, but there have been also instances where you have been credited as working, of course, on your own, uh, solo writer. Uh, and so uh, could you give us uh, just some insight into how that works for you in terms of working with a collaborator on some projects and then maybe working on your own on other projects? I know, of course, there are different elements and I can assume there are different 
it depends on the topic. It depends on the time of maybe point in, in time in your life and many other factors I'm, I can imagine. But could you let us uh, in on a little bit of your own process? How, how, do you, how do you work when you're working with a particular collaborator versus how do you work when you're working on your own? Yeah, well, um, again, you, think, you see, uh, the idea is, is that I keep myself open. So I'm, I'm, I'm a good collaborator. So to me, it's really easy to work with someone else or, or, or some other people, not only one. Uh, I'm, I'm used to it. Uh, you mentioned two of my main collaborators, obviously my brother and Luis. Uh, I have other in my life, uh, some which were terribly unsuccessful. And, 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 I, and I can only remember painful stories from them. Because uh, when you collaborate, it's all about human relationships and, uh, and sometimes they don't work. And, and, and that has happened, obviously, in the past. And, and then some other that were cool, but had not think of doing something again. And then, uh, people that you encounter later in life and there's like like uh, again uh, different ways of of expressing oneself and one of those ways is through uh, collaborating in the writing and and to me that is easy and, and, and the main difference is that when I write, when I'm on my own, well, I don't have someone else to be uh, ping-ponging the ideas with, which is what you basically do with a partner, you know? So I, I had to do it myself, uh, you know, I mean, uh, in a way, uh, and, and then just do it because that's how you also, I started writing alone, you know, so I mean, it's not that I'm not used to it. Uh, on the on the contrary, I do it most of the time because even when you collaborate, is it depending on the collaboration? Because in, in some collaborations, it's like word by word collaboration, but in some other, um, uh, you can write separately and then you know come back and give notes and correct and. So, I mean, it's, a lot of the writing is done in solitude, you know, because it happens here, it doesn't happen in the keyboard. That is really fascinating, especially for me, as I say, I'm not an artist or a writer. So whenever I hear artists speak about their process, I am so fascinated by this. And uh, another part of your process, which You've mentioned a little bit earlier today about, uh, for example, uh, François Truffaut and uh, Quatre Cent Coups of the 400 Blows. And I, I'd like to ask you also, what have been some of your uh, in influences from cinema that you can say have informed you as an artist and as a filmmaker? Uh, for example, I, I recall in the, uh, in the creation of Itumama Tambien, I know that uh, there was reference made to Godard, Jean-Luc Godard, uh, masculine and feminine, I think being a primary example in terms of the employment of a narrator structure that is both kind of ironic and also uh, very uh, neutral, but maybe not so. It, it has a nice playful atmosphere with, the, with what's happening on the screen and the characters. Uh, so there's Godard and Nouvelle Vague, and I also know, uh, for instance, with some of with your early work in particular, the idea of the romantic comedy, uh, La Comedia de Endredos. Excuse me for my poor pronunciation. Like screwball comedy type of of work, we see like Blake Edwards influence or Ernest Lubitsch influence, uh, all the way from uh, the, the the work uh, like Solo uh, con tu pareja, for example. So uh, I, I'd love to know some of your uh, cinematic influences uh, and what films or what filmmakers do you think have, uh, have influenced you in terms of your uh, film loving uh, and also as an artist? 
Yeah, well, you just mentioned a bunch of them. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, obviously uh, there are some more. Um, I, um, I, I love uh, Goody Allen. Um, uh, the the Coen Brothers uh, are amazing. Um, uh, also, in, I'm thinking I'm thinking for, first because the world is huge. <laughs> I'm thinking first in the U.S. But uh, uh, um, and also living or dead, you know. Uh, uh, um, oh, oh, Basically, the, the, the big, uh, the great American directors, you know, Wes Anderson, P.T. Anderson, those kind of directors, uh, uh, they will always influence you because sometimes the influences are subconscious, you know, I mean, you never, don't even know that you, what you're doing is what you're doing. It's not like with, uh, uh, with um, Tarantino, you know, that he's very conscious of his uh, homages or, or references to other films. Um, uh, but I've also taken from, example, from the Tartans. Uh, uh, I, I see it, probably nobody else sees it, but uh, in in the in many ways how I establish the point of view of the kid in 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 Besos de Azúcar is is very is very there done. Um, and um, and obviously some other Mexican filmmakers and and filmmakers from from all over over the world obviously uh, because there's great filmmakers everywhere so I, everything I see must I sure it affects me so it make, creates an influence but I don't work like with a, a, a conscious influence you know I, I don't say I, I want to make a film like Godard because I'm not Godard what I can say is is great masculine feminine how he uses the elements and, and use them in my own way, in my own story, in, you know, that I understand. Oh, that's really well said. Uh, thank you so much for this. And th the, w one of the things also uh, that I, I mean, you, know, you, you mentioned this idea about how you are constantly sort of be absorbing things and ideas and creativity. And uh, you mentioned it earlier in terms of your living your life and your family, but it also sounds like this is, the, this is also true for your cinema life and uh, watching films. And you said it's almost subconscious, which I find very fascinating. Uh, very fascinating indeed. This is uh, uh, very illuminating from my point of view. Um, and, uh, and it brings me to my next question too, which is your work as a filmmaker is uh, very fascinating, as I say, for many reasons. One of which I think is the fact that you work in, uh, in the short film medium and you work in the feature film uh, length medium. So feature length films, uh, but also short films. And so, uh, may I ask, uh, are, how, do you, how do you see the short film medium from your perspective as an artist versus how do you see the feature film medium from your point of view as an artist? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I would say that in general terms, one makes short films, uh, as a learning process to make a feature film, you know, I mean that 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 I would say is like uh, the majority of the filmmakers' way. I would say most of us have done first a couple of short films at least before before we do a, a, a feature, you know, a long feature, uh, and then. Uh, there are some filmmakers that are artists of the form, 
of the genre. Uh, and so uh, there are filmmakers that they only make short films, you know, <laughs> and, and they're amazing at doing uh, short films. And then there are other filmmakers that have never done a short film and who are great at doing uh, long features, you know, because there's every kind of thing. But I think that most of us have done short films as a, as a learning process, you know. And then, you know, uh, because at least in Mexico, but I think perhaps every, everywhere, short films, you have to like, basically finance them yourself. Uh, you make them with the, with the help of your friends and sometimes with the help of institutions or many times with the help of in, uh, different institutions uh, in the different countries. And, and it, obviously you do not earn any money out of the short films and, and there are a lot of sacrifice. So every time I say I will not do another short film, somebody invites me to a cool project where I don't have to invest my own money, you know, uh, and I, I just kept saying yes, because, because I like doing short films. I, I rather do by a zillion times, short, you know, uh, a short film than a commercial, because in a commercial, I mean, you may be telling a story, but you're, what you're doing is selling a product. In a short film, you are expressing yourself as well as you're expressing in a long feature. It's, it's just that it's a short, it's a short form, and, and, and that's it. Um, I, and, and I love to make them, but I I, I got tired of, of of what comes along with them. You know, kind of half financed them. So the last I don't know how many shorts that I've done are. Sh Shorts that I was invited to, a, like this thing with El Sandwich de Mariana. I was invited to a, this project, which was cool, so that I didn't have to finance it because this organization financed the, the films. And the same happened with uh, La uh, uh, Una Piedra en el Camino, uh, this short that is very political, uh, that is a documentary, a, doc a docu short. And it also happened with the last one. Well, El Sandwich de Mariana. Ah, oh, no. The second bakery attack. I mean, I just had to do it. Because if you get the, the, the rights from a Murakami short story, well, shoot it. <laughs> you have the rights. <laughs> this is great. Wonderful. Because my next question was going to be about one of your short films, which is The Second Bakery Attack. And I'm here, of course, in Tokyo. And the film is, of course, based off of a short story, a uh, work written by the Japanese author, Haruki Murakami. And you took the setting and you, you took the story and you, you made it into a very fascinating uh, adaptation uh, and so I was, uh, uh, I, I wanted to ask you uh, the, well, first I wanted to ask you, uh, this is uh, one of your films where you are uh, adapting the work of another. Uh, you mentioned uh, Chekhov before, of course, but here we have an, uh, Murakami. And so uh, the first thing I must ask you is, is uh, well, first of all, uh, may I ask, uh, how, what is your feeling about the works of Murakami in general? And from there, how, what was it that attracted you uh, to this project in the first place? Well, um, I'm a Murakami fan. Uh. I mean, I have to define myself basically as a Murakami fan and, um, and because I was in Japan and so how it is, I know that uh, also the nation is divided. I should have to say that he has more fans than haters, but he has also a lot of haters in Japan. And, uh, and uh, well, truly speaking, that's one of those things that happen in life. I mean, my friend, uh, Lucas Sakoskin, who is a producer and who is also the actor who does the, the, the guy in the grill, um, invited me uh, to, to make a short film from 
one of these packages of short films that they used to make and sometimes they still do, uh, especially the, the, the cellular servers, you know, uh, the phone servers. And, um, and I was going to, about to, to dive into, into Rudo and, and Cursi's, uh, Rudo y Cursi's uh, pre-production. So I didn't have the time, you know, and I didn't want him to nag me about a short film when I was going to make my long feature. And, um, and so I, uh, I told him, no, I, I can't right now. And, 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 and he said, okay, well, think of something. And I said, well, I don't have a story right now. And he said, man, you always have stories or you have something that you want to adapt, you know, and, and just to get him away from me, <laughs> basically, I, I, I said, well, there is this uh, Haruki Murakami story. Um, and if you get the rights, well, let's see if that happens, but I'm going to make my, uh, my long feature. And, and he said, okay, and I knew, he didn't know who Murakami was, but I knew, so I knew that it was going to be difficult. And, uh, but to my surprise, I was shooting Rudy Cursi, I was on the beach and this guy, this guy call, calls me to tell me I have the rights. Uh, and I was surprised because uh, he got the rights. Uh, so when I finished Rudy Cursi, uh, I was committed to do it because uh, what I understand is that Murakami uh, asked to, uh, I mean, he gave the rights, but they were committed to, to myself. And I, I had to write and direct the short. And, uh, and, and it was, to me, it was like, wow, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a honor. <laughs> because I'm a fan and um, and and that's why I did it uh, you know I mean Lucas got the money from some friends in New York because what is amazing about Murakami uh, because of uh, his own life story is that in many ways he's many, very universal and very accessible to Westerners uh, because he lived as part of his life in the U.S. and because he uh, he 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 he's an expert of, in American literature um, and at the same time he's profoundly Japanese and uh, and that, that's what I love about him that to me he's so accessible as a Westerner. And so he introduces me to these fantastic worlds in Japan and Japanese symbolism that I wouldn't know otherwise because, <laughs> because he makes these things accessible to me. Uh, and that's why I like him so much. And, and the second bakery attack is a, it's a very simple short story and, and it's very cinematic. And, 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 and what I did uh, is, uh, you know, the, the, in the short story, the narrator is the male character. And, and I turned it around because I thought that it was more interesting to, to have her point of view instead of his point of view. And then there is this metaphor of the state of the marriage, uh, the, I mean, symbolized by the guy rowing towards a exploding volcano. So instead of, of, of trying to make any sense out of that, because to me, and I told uh, Mr. Murakami when I met him, to me, it was just a metaphor. <laughs> I, I hope he didn't feel insulted. Uh, I mean, I don't think so. Uh, uh, well, I, I didn't need to, to have the guy rowing towards the volcano because it was a metaphor of the state of the, of the marriage. So I transferred that to the conflict and, and only told that very linear uh, story that happens in, in the second break attack. And that again, is totally universal. I mean, that story, you can set it up in New York, 
in Tokyo, in Mexico City, in Buenos Aires, and we discussed all those places. When, when Lucas got the rights, I mean, I love Buenos Aires. So I told him, man, I would love to shoot in Buenos Aires. Let's do it in Buenos Aires. But because he's Argentinian uh, and he was living in New York, well, he, you know, he, we did it in New York and I think it was, it was cool. It was very cool to make it. You know, it was a great experience. Uh, it was a great to, to meet uh, Kirsten Dunst and, uh, and Bright Gerarty. And it was great to, to work with Lucas, who is my friend, and to, and to shoot in New York, which is a, an amazing city that I love. You know, and you just have the experience to shoot a Murakami story, man. I mean, why not? This is really fascinating because uh, I, I, I don't know, I mean, I, well, I should take a step back, which is I too am a huge fan of the works of uh, Murakami, very much so. And I understand also what you say about his fans and his detractors, but I, I count myself very firmly in the fan camp. And one of the things I find so fascinating about both his work and your your work on this story, and thus, by extension, your work as a whole, is that I see many similarities and overlaps between uh, Murakami's work and your work. And I don't know, uh, you know I mean, well, uh, for example, I see a lot in your work and in Murakami's work and in the second bakery attack for as a great example, this idea of, of, of the, the relationship and the sort of quirky spin on, on relationships. So the relationship itself is something that is an accessibility point. You raised the point so well about how Murakami's work is very accessible to audiences outside of Japan even though he does deal with very Japanese themes, I would suggest. I would also, in turn, uh, with great respect, suggest the same thing about your work, in that you have so many points in your work where we, as audiences, maybe outside of Mexico, uh, can really enter the world and really explore these relationships that we can understand, and yet still at the same time uh, experience a story that I think deals very specifically with, uh, uh, with themes of um, uh, culture and politics and uh, society of Mexico. Uh, I mean, we saw this, I think, uh, very early on um, uh, and uh, the sort of middle class, emerging middle class and the AIDS crisis in, in uh, um, uh, so welcome to Pareja. AIDS, of course, affected many parts of the world, of course, but it had, but it also affected uh, 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 Mexico at the time. We see this a lot with Itumama Tambien, this, this overlap, this brilliant overlap between what is political and in the background in a way, but it's also very much in the foreground. Uh, but, but also it becomes a story that is about self-discovery and youth and adolescence and sex and relationships. And these are things that we all, I think, can, can relate to and access. So even though I, as a person outside of Mexico, am watching this film, I can understand this. Uh, um, Rudo Icursi is the same thing, this idea of a relationship and sports and kind of a friendship and rivalry and this kind of, of uh, and set against this backdrop, which I think creates this wonderful dynamic between the, the universal and accessible on the one hand and the, the, the culturally significant and uh, maybe perhaps even politically significant on the other, which I find very fascinating. So your talking about Murakami in this way, I think is, is really quite, uh, quite fascinating. Uh, there is something very existential, the existential dilemma of his characters and your characters and how they, they, they deal with that in the context of their particular environments whether it be for him maybe Japanese or Japan, or for maybe your stories uh, in the particular environs that your characters inhabit. And so, uh, you know, is, is there a kind of, how should I put it? Um, 
um, well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just going off here, but I try, I'm just uh, in admiration of your work, but I find it fascinating that you speak about Murakami in this way. And so in many ways, I find this work to be uh, uh, such a great marriage between two separate artists from two different parts of the world, but they seem to have such strong overlap. Uh, so I wonder if, if, you, if you feel that way uh, in terms of uh, Murakami's work and your own work and your own interests and concerns and themes in the, the work that you have created. Yeah, well, you, you know, I mean, I was not aware of that parallelism that you are talking about, uh, and of course, but I, uh, what I can say is that obviously uh, there's something in what uh, Murakami writes that resounds in me. Uh, and that I find all, uh, both very appealing uh, and uh, and weirdly accessible. I mean, uh, because sometimes, uh, because Murakami is a great mix of that, of, of West and East and, uh, and, 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 and Japan and Boston, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and things that are close to me and, uh, and human relationships. Uh, and, and, and probably because we understand that uh, what is great about storytelling is to have uh, universal stories, universal characters, universal values probably, um, in very specific contexts. And, and, and those things behave differently uh, depending on the context. And, and, but we relate to that because what we relate to is uh, we relate to most of it emotion uh, and behavior and and behavior is related to emotion uh, and so uh, and that's what we're looking for and that's why we are as human beings are looking for at the day to be moved in many ways uh, that's what entertainment is about uh, that's what art is about of obviously that's what sports is about it's all about moving emotions, and, uh, and and that's what we and, and how we relate. I mean, how can you not relate to that other beautiful short story about the one hundred percent perfect girl? I mean, again, that's something that has happened to you, to me, that can happen, you know, in Kyoto or shit, man, in Guadalajara, Mexico, you know. Uh, and 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 that's what's so so beautiful about his uh, his writing, uh, even when these Japanese monsters happen, <laughs> because sometimes out of the blue there's some weird stuff, obviously. But um, but I but I think that is really endearing. Well, and I, re I resonate to it. I and I I resonate with Japan. I mean, there's this, you know, I. I, I well not not now because of the the epidemic but but I kind of travel a lot and um, and there are places in the world where I feel at home or that or that I lived there before in a previous life or something like that you know and one of those places is Japan you know I mean. Uh, I would hear all my American friends mostly saying, oh, you're going to Japan, you're going to get lost in translation, remember the movie. And then I went to Japan and never, I never got lost in translation because it's so easy to go around <laughs> Japan, you know. <laughs> and I had a great time and, and, I, and I love diversity. And, and Japan is so different from Mexico that I love it. Oh, that's, I'm so touched by your, your words here about Japan. Um, and, uh, you know, it, again, with this terrible world situation, of course, traveling is, is uh, impossible at the moment. But, you know, one of these days, if traveling can commence again, and if ever you find yourself in Japan, uh, I would love to, to, uh, to, to meet you in person. Uh, and, and welcome you to Japan with open arms. But uh, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, is, is there, are there any, uh, we've mentioned Murakami, uh, are there any kinds of, uh, do, 
are you, uh, do you watch, for instance, Japanese uh, film or Japanese cinema? Well, yeah, it's not that I have a lot of access to it because mm. the Japanese cinema that I can see is the, the, the Japanese films that, that travels to the festivals, basically. And then not, not all of it because uh, not all of it gets to Mexico or I'm not in a festival so I can see it, you know. Uh, but in my life, uh, Japanese cinema is very dear and very close because it basically changed my life. Uh, it, uh, it, f f the first time that I saw Ikiru, I understood that that filmmaking could be about something else, not only about entertainment. It's 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 a it's a film. I saw. I was very young. I think I was like thirteen, probably. Uh, and and my mother uh, took me uh, to see it. And Kurosawa was very popular in a, in a very intellectual middle class in Mexico City. And and it moved me. It moved me so deeply that uh, it changed me. You know, I, I understood. You know, because my mother was like that. That probably the day before I saw Star Wars, and I loved it. But with I I I Ikiru, I I understood that that filmmaking was about. Uh, that and many other things, <laughs> and uh, uh, and yeah, and then Kurosawa, of course, it's is is very close to me because it was popular in uh, in in Mexico, and um, and I loved his films, you know, and like some of them uh, related to Shakespearean themes or plays that were not the Shakespearean plays because you also have the same legends. Uh, and, and, and I'm a huge Kurosawa fan, you know. Uh, it started with Ikiru, obviously, but, uh, but I don't know if I've seen them all. I probably have. Uh, and at some point in my life, he was my favorite. Uh, you know, when he did run, and, and all those films, I was like, whoa, I was really raving about him. And, uh, and then, but I cannot say that, that I know many other uh, uh, Japanese filmmakers. Uh, some, of course, uh, I will remember if, if you tell me the name, uh, his, his name or the name or her name or the, or, or the movie, and I will remember. Because obviously it's not only uh, about uh, Kurosawa, uh, uh, Japanese cinema. And, and, and in the present time, the, my, my problem is that I can only see the, you know, like I think the last Japanese, uh, current Japanese film that I saw is, uh, well, it, it won the Oscar, no? Uh, the, the, the one about the thieves. It, 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 like it was like two years ago uh, uh, the uh, what's it called beautiful movie yeah Corey, yeah the filmmakers Coreda. yeah yeah exactly the film. Yes. Exactly. shoplifters yes shoplifters yes exactly. yes yeah i was thinking thieves but no shoplifters uh, uh i think that was the last uh, Japanese film that I saw, and you were saying Koreda, yeah, that's another obviously contemporary reference, another great filmmaker. Uh, because Japanese culture is, uh, is, is, is very interesting, it's very deep, and, and, and for a Westerner, it's, it's a, a very interesting mystery, uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, when, when you come from a, from, from a country which is kind of colorful and chaotic and you arrive to Japan, to these orderly places, <laughs> and which are not even chaotic in chaos, because I'm thinking on, on how you call that station, Shinjiku, whatever, that crossing that is crazy, 
it's crazy and yet it's so perfectly ordained you know uh, and then the architecture and the art that resolves you know i mean here in mexico everything is still very baroque you know and complex and then uh, japanese is like zen you know it's like one line and that line is so beautiful <laughs> it's so simple and so beautiful and so full of life and yeah i know when when i i went there to well actually to to present the short film and I had to put the opportunity to meet uh, Mr. Murakami. And I also, well, you know, sightseed uh, Tokyo in a very nice way because I have a friend there uh, called Ken. Uh, he's an, one of those uh, crazy Americans that have become Japanese. And, uh, and, and we would go uh, with, uh, with him to to basically do promotion. So I went through Tokyo to through different uh, neighborhoods and places that people don't usually see. And we also did the other thing, you know, what people usually do in Tokyo. And also obviously we went to Kyoto, which is also fascinating. It's just so beautiful and, and, and intriguing, you know, and uh, and I also remember in, in, in Tokyo, the Mexican embassy where you are, which is a beautiful building in a, in a beautiful part of Tokyo. And, uh, and having a great dinner with the ambassador back then. Uh, I had a, a, a really, really great time. And my kids love Japan, love the trip. My, my wife also, you know, I mean, when, when we finish a trip, and we are sad, and we all say, I, I, I wish I could live there. <laughs> it's, uh, it's because something happened. And, and it usually happens in, well, it happened with Japan. And, and it, it has to do with, uh, with the culture shock, with how, uh, how different we are, and at the same time, how we are the same. Because, because of that, we relate to emotions, for example. You know, and, and, and I will probably will not understand some symbols the way you do as, as you will not understand some of our symbols. And yet we perfectly relate to each other because it's all about the human experience. Yeah, well, that is so, so well said. So well said, you know, there are many differences and you know, even from my point of view, when I watch your works, uh, for example, you know, there are many uh, cultural elements and political elements that I will, of course, do my best to study and try to catch all the references that I can uh, in terms of, for example, maybe politically references may be made to PRI or to uh, uh, the names of the characters, for instance, uh, in Itumama Tambien, for example, uh, Cortez is used uh, very, I think, uh, specifically, uh, and things of that nature. Uh, but there are many things also that I will never be able to catch. Uh, language uh, nuances like uh, 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 the dialect, the Chilango dialect, yes. and things of that nature. I know it's very important uh, and very significant in the works, but I cannot catch it, of course, because I, I'm not uh, unfortunately familiar enough with the, the language nuances. But at the same time, I can say that there is a universality, uh, a kind of accessibility in the, the work. Uh, and also just that is, I think, reflective of just the cultural exchange that uh, exists naturally uh, between uh, the, the two cultures. And I think you've expressed it so well, the idea of we, we experience it emotionally and, uh, and that how that is uh, reflective not just in terms of your work, but also obviously in terms of your life and your interactions in your own life, the idea of experiencing things emotionally and, and how that, and, and relationships and things that we all can understand. Like I in Japan can understand these, uh, these relationships, these, uh, these romantic relationships that are in 
uh, uh, your short films, um, uh, You Owe Me One, or uh, I can understand uh, to some degree uh, the, 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 the child uh, perspective uh, uh, in, your, in your short works. Uh, and also I can understand to some degree the notion of adolescence and discovery and uh, uh, attraction and uh, sort of the uh, sexual and personal and emotional discovery in, uh, in your works. And so I think these kind of accessibility points that you uh, describe in terms, of your, in terms of how you approach other works and also that is inherent in your works as well, I think uh, forms a, a really fundamentally important yet artistically valuable a kind of cultural overlap, to put it in a very blunt way. But uh, my point is that there is a kind of connectivity that uh, I think uh, makes uh, your work uh, very powerful and very accessible uh, from uh, someone in my position. Uh, and I, I really want to thank you so much for that kind of really powerful and important insight, both in terms of art and also in terms of life. Oh, you know, I mean, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, it, 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 thank you. I mean, I, I just do what I do. You know, I mean, I just, I, I don't think uh, about it. You know, I mean, you, you kind of put me in a perspective here. And, uh, uh, and but at the end of the day, I, I just, uh, I just want to express myself. And uh, and in doing so, I, I I hope that we can connect as human beings in, in in different levels, in different ways. I mean, I don't see nationalities. You know, I mean, I'm I'm obviously Mexican, and when I'm writing um, in Spanish and in Mexican specifically, uh, yeah, obviously that I think on. I can think on my context, uh, but I'm always uh, uh, thinking that the, uh, that the universality is 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 what um, what puts us together. What you know, we, we make the links uh, as as human beings. Even though things are different in Japan, and you have different uh, language and different symbols and and etc you know uh, and 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 uh, sometimes i think it has worked sometimes better sometimes worse <laughs> you know you know i never know because i do not talk about what i do oh, you know uh, but uh, what i can say is that i i i am um, I'll keep on doing it, and I hope that I, I can return to Japan because I really, for example, I mean, I think this sounds crazy, but I would like to make a film in Japan about what I don't know. Who cares? <laughs> Let's make a film in Japan. Oh my goodness! If that could happen, oh my goodness! I mean, I I for one would be so yeah. over the moon. That would be such a, a great thing. Oh gosh! If if that could happen, you know, the the film gods uh please make it happen yes of course this whole world situation of course it's terrible and it has to calm oh, down yeah. of course but but yes once it does yes it will overcome i mean uh, yes. i mean yeah it's terrible the pandemic is horrible it screwed us all it's the truth but but we'll overcome it you know i mean it will not be here forever in the sense that uh, as as it was this year, you know, or it has been this year. And uh, I hope to, I, I will not say recuperate the past normalcy. I, I prefer to have a new one because there's a lot that we have to learn because of COVID. I mean, COVID came here to teach us a lesson and it is, to each of us to understand what lesson it is, but I hope that that is a, a lesson in consciousness, most of it, uh, because we're killing the planet. So uh, I, I, I hope that we can, that we overcome it as a species, 
uh, but that we are uh, that we will walk the path of, of light, the light of conscious, the, the path of consciousness. Because because if we if do not start doing that as a whole, not as individuals only, um, we're we're going to kill the planet. You know, well said, well said, and uh, yes, yes, this is. This is a moment that we will overcome. It will take work and it will take time, as you indicate. But, and we are all facing our own certain specific challenges, of course, of course. So, uh, but, uh, you know, this is something that we can overcome because we are that strong. So you're absolutely right. And uh, once this is overcome, and once things are uh, to a kind of I mean, what you indicated, I think, as a new normal. Uh, one, but once things are to the point where perhaps you can visit Japan once again, um, I mean, I don't know. You, obviously, you you are uh, you are an artist, and you are very famous, and you're much. You're, you would be so busy, of course. But if it if I could if I could meet you in person, if it was just for one, even for one, maybe maybe five seconds, uh, it would be such a pleasure. Would that be okay? Well, once this is over and you come to Japan, uh, I'd love to be able to meet you in person just for a little bit. And of course you would be, I, I don't want to intrude on your schedule, but if that's okay with you, then it would be my pleasure. Of course, that is okay. It, it would be a pleasure to meet you in Japan or in Mexico or uh, oh, the world is big, man. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's 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 only it's only one world. Let's stop seeing each other as as neighbors and start understanding each other as roomies, and then life is gonna be easier. Oh, uh, Carlos Cuarón, I want to thank you so much. Thank you so much for your very valuable time today. I know you're so busy, uh, and so I I want to say once again. I am so honored to have been able to speak with you directly. And I want to say, I'm sorry to just, I talk too much. I'm so sorry, but I just want to say that, you know, your, you, your work has, is so fascinating and it is universal and it is so accessible, even where I don't understand everything and I don't, it's so accessible and so uh, I feel it. And I speak for many when I say it, is, it has affected me so much. And I look forward so much to your, uh, your work, uh, Amalgama. I hope it can be released uh, here in Japan and everywhere, as many places as possible. You know, in the, in the next year, of course, uh, there's a lot of work ahead I, I can appreciate. But hopefully, yes, uh, I, can, I look forward to that very much. Yeah, well, how about trying to go to to uh, the Tokyo Film Festival? Not this year, because it's going to be crazy. Next year, <laughs> you know, after the Olympics. <laughs> uh, and uh, it would be amazing. I would love to go to again to, to Tokyo and the Tokyo Film Festival with Amalgama, because I, would, I think that you would like it, you know, the Japanese audiences. Because it's again, I... Um, I mean, it's a four character piece, so it's an ensemble piece. So it's something very different. You have four heroes, so to speak. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's a lot of fun and uh, it's about humanity because it, it's a character driven piece, a character driven comedy about pain uh, between four dentists that meet in a convention. Uh, an experience a weekend together to kind of uh, overcome their conflicts, uh, you know, and, uh, and and so I I think that yeah, I do like it, and I of course, I mean, independently in the film festival to to show the the film in Japan in any other outlet, you know, whether it is Netflix or or whichever. Uh, I just want my films to be seen by people, you know, and I hope that they enjoy it. Not, it doesn't happen always, but <laughs> when, when, when they enjoy it, then I'm happy. And, 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 and there are many ways of enjoying it, you know, I mean, you can enjoy a movie like, for example, I'm I, I, a huge Carlos Regadas fan. 
and, uh, and, and some people see his cinema as very slow and boring. And it's not slow and boring to me because I see other things uh, 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 that are entertaining, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, each has a, a different concept. Well, I look forward to this very much, and, and yes, the, the opportunities uh, uh, to watch uh, your works going forward, as well as to re-explore the works that you've done. I'm looking forward to this very much. So, um, I just, to, just before we end, I just want to be absolutely sure, because, you know, my pronunciation is so poor, I have to apologize once again for profoundly for this. So your latest work is, is uh, please, can you tell me how, how to pronounce it correctly? Amalgama? Amalgama? Yes, Amalgama. Oh. You said it. Amalgama. Thank you so much. So the work is Amalgama, and we shall, I will look forward to reading up on the updates and, and uh, to completion, and when it shows, uh, then I will certainly uh, try my best to, to, to find it and watch it. And mm. I look forward to it so much. I, I think that uh, we'll release it next year because this year is already lost. And, and I hope we can make some festivals, including Tokyo next year. And uh, yeah, and let's see what happens. You know, I, we don't know. We're, we're living on certain times and, uh, and, and trying to make the best out of it. So. Yeah. I hope it happens. I hope so too. And so, uh, and thank you once again for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, again, best of luck with uh, this and your future endeavors. Uh, hopefully, maybe one day, if I'm fortunate enough, uh, I, I can uh, speak with you again. I would certainly, uh, I would love the opportunity so much. I can't tell you enough how much this conversation has meant to me. I'm a very big fan of your work and uh, it has given me a lot of, uh, of inspiration and joy. And uh, I, 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 I'm so sorry to just t keep talking about that, but uh, I really do feel that way. And I'm a very big admirer. So thank you so much for everything that you've done for all of us in the film community and the art community for teaching us and uh, giving us uh, and inspiring us with your work. It has been so, so wonderful. And, uh, and of course, most importantly, uh, during these times, uh, the, the most important thing is your health and your well-being. Uh, so uh, please, my warmest regards to you and your family and friends during these times. You know, I hope everyone is safe and taking very good care of yourself. That is the most important thing. So, uh, you know, my warmest regards to you and your family and friends during these times. Uh, please stay safe and be well. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Daisuke. It was a pleasure, it was a great conversation and, um, and you have my email. So whatever you, whatever, whatever you need, uh, you know how to contact me. And if you come to Mexico, please let me know. Thank you so much. Uh, Carlos Cuaron, thank you very much for your time. Uh, so uh, my dear friends, this has been an, a conversation with uh, the one, the only Mr. Carlos Cuaron. And so I will uh, leave uh, just information about his works uh, in the description box uh, below. Uh, and also I want to thank, uh, before I leave, I want to uh, thank the uh, Embassy of Mexico here in Tokyo. And I want to thank uh, in particular, uh, Miguel uh, Mojedano Batel. So Miguel at the Embassy of Mexico, I want to thank you very much. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, to, and this kind of wonderful collaboration and cooperation uh, between Japan and uh, Mexico. Uh, thank you so much. And Carlos Cuaron, thank you. And please have a great rest of your day and evening. <laughs> you too. Have thank a great you. day. You have the, the, uh, the whole day ahead of you. Uh, I'm having the, the last hours of, of the day. And I'll, have a, I'll watch a movie. <laughs> oh, what movie are you going to watch?
I don't know. I'll see. I'll see what I catch, or, or yeah, yeah, or a TV series. I don't know something. Okay. There's a lot. <laughs> there is certainly indeed there is a lot. So, well, my well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Carlos Coron. Thank you again, and please be well. And we will talk again soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.